Please do turn this morning to Genesis, the book of Genesis, in chapter 2, and we read this verse in 18, Genesis 2 and verse 18. We're thinking of foundational truths in these beginning chapters of Genesis, and we read verse 18. We didn't read it earlier. Genesis 2 and verse 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him an help meet for him. So our subject this morning is God's design in marriage and also in that marriage of Christ and his church. This is a message this morning for everyone for those who are married and not married. Genesis 2 and verse 18, God had said, everything was good, but here he says it's not good. Well, this is no contradiction. As I mentioned last week in Genesis chapter 1, we have the unfolding creation. And in Genesis chapter 2, we have an expanded account with more detail, more focus perhaps not on just what God had created, but upon the relationships that we are to have with Almighty God. And so the author, Moses, he hones in here in verse 18 and he notices a potential problem. He sees Adam alone. Oh, he's not alone. He has all the animals and he has God. But of course the Lord knew that there would be a great fall. And everything that God makes in creation is to help man, to help men and women. He sees all the problems that lie ahead and here there is an embryonic problem. He looks at the animals and he says, they're not good enough. Adam can't speak to the animals. Well, he can, but the animals won't answer back in a language which is intelligent, with emotion, with feelings, with sensitivities. And so he sees there's a problem. Well, don't get me wrong, everything that God makes in its entirety is very good. That's what it says in Genesis 1, 31. God saw that everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. But by the time he says it's very good, Adam and Eve in chapter 1 have already been made. We see it down here that Adam and Eve in chapter 1 have been made. But how were they made? Well, that's what Genesis chapter 2 says. So the whole of creation was very good. Of course it was, because it was divinely created, everything. God didn't need billions of years he didn't need small successive changes of evolution. No, he spoke the word and it came into existence. Light, the animals, the filling of the void, stars, sun, moon, we've thought of this. And it was divinely designed. That's why it was very good. Everything was in a system. And once it was finished, it was complete. Evolution can't say that. Evolution says it's getting better and better, and that's not what we see. It's getting worse and worse because the world without God is incomplete. The world without God is fallen, and there's gaping holes. And it's very good, going back to the account, because it's been designed to be human-centric. Of course, 
God is over all, he's supreme, but everything in the created order, here in this universe, has been made for me and you. It's so obvious. All that we need to eat, to exist, the temperature, the climate, beauty, food, it's been made for us. So it's not surprising that when we come to Genesis 2, 18, recapping and filling out the narrative, the Lord God notices and he pauses. He says, before he'd finished creation, man on his own is incomplete. It is not good that man should be alone. So three headings this morning. A problem foreseen. Secondly, a helper provided. And then thirdly, a very significant covenant relationship created on two levels, as we shall see. Well, let's look at the problem. It is not good. That doesn't mean it's sinful, but it means there is an incomplete aspect to a person when they're on their own. Now, I'm going to say at the beginning, there are some people that go through life and they never get married or they have some great tragedy and sadness and they live their life for a time alone. That does not mean that you are incomplete because the marriage picture is either fulfilled in Christ alone or with Christ and a companion. Christ alone is sufficient. So we will see that this picture of marriage is fulfilled in two ways. One of them is necessary, Christ. The other one is also pictured in this relationship. We'll come back to it. So let's think first of the problem that the Lord foresees. The Lord God said, it is not good. What's he speaking about? Isolation. Loneliness. Do you know that's one of the great curses of the age that we live in? Loneliness and isolation. Never has the world been more connected. They say we have only six degrees of separation, but never has the world been more connected by telecommunications we could never have dreamed of 20 years ago, and yet there is more loneliness and isolation than ever before. Why is that? Because 98% of people in this country are disconnected from God and the church and Jesus Christ, who is the one that makes us ultimately complete. Isolation and loneliness, a terrible position to be in. And you know, many people, they choose to be that way because they could be in a church, they could have the Lord's people, they could have Christ as the friend of sinners that sticks closer to us than a brother or a sister, but they choose. There are teenagers, and I say this sensitively, somebody said to me just this week, their 19-year-old son had not been out of his room for four months. And yet, he's on the computer every hour, seemingly, of every waking hour of the day. Connected, but disconnected. It is not good. 
that man or woman should be alone. And you know there's another problem when people withdraw themselves. God doesn't want us to withdraw. He doesn't want us to lead solitary, singular lives. We are made to be social. God is the God of society. He's the God that puts us and wants us to be in relationships together. Let me use an example. How many times have we seen in recent years, and it's usually a man who hides away, his thinking becomes so extreme, and then something awful, terrible happens. Nobody to challenge the thinking. Nobody to condition and say, are you sure? Is that right? Is that good? And months and years go by. Isolation, loneliness, extremism. And it goes to an extreme. And then something terrible happens. So God sees the problem. He foresees the problem. He sees people living alone. He sees Adam. Adam isn't alone yet because he's still in communion, in conversation with his God. But he knows that when there is sin in the world, there will be separation. There'll be distance. There'll be withdrawing. Always be careful. Do you know it's one of the things that worries me most as a pastor? You see somebody withdrawing from the fellowship, sitting alone upstairs, because they don't want to be with other people. Not coming to the meetings and you know they're a lonely person and they need to be with people and they're withdrawing. It's a great danger. The problem of loneliness and isolation. God is the God of society. He's the one that wants us to be sociable he sees that to be alone is uncomfortable and it's unprofitable. Therefore, he has a plan. He has a plan to make a relationship. And this morning I'm going to apply this not just to marriage, but to all relationships. Somebody that shuts down and gives the silent treatment to any husband and wife, never do that. Never withdraw. Never let the sun go down on sin. Deal with it. Don't isolate. Don't withdraw. Put things right. Be in communion and in relationship with one another. That's not God's way. Unless... There's been some terrible sin where we can't just carry on the same and God says we have to withdraw for a time. We have to stop the communion, the fellowship, the conversation because to carry on as just as though everything was the same would be to condone that sin. Well, I've gone off my subject. A problem foreseen. Secondly, what does God do about it? And, and the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. It's not good that anybody should be alone. He does something about it. I will make in his creation. It's not complete until he's established the need for relationships. I will make him and help meet. I will make him. God sees all our needs. He saw that we would need rest. That's why he makes the Lord's day, the Sabbath day. He saw that we would need time to relax. That's why he made the Garden of Eden with all its beauty and the sound. And he sees that we will need companionship. That's why he gives relationships, 
communion, intimacy, oneness, friendship. This is God's plan. Do you see the three needs? And he's met them in the plan of creation. The Sabbath, the Lord's Day, the garden, teaching us that we can rest, and for them, they could work and have purpose, and then the provision of Eve, symbolically, to speak of relationships. Why did God make Eve? Was it to satisfy a base, carnal desire within men and women? No, it wasn't. There's not been any sin. There's no speaking of sin. To be lonely is not to be sinful. To sin is when you could do something about it and when you could be with others, but you choose not to. You isolate, you withdraw, you take yourself to one side and you don't need to do that. Self-inflicted isolation. But to be lonely, that's a natural feeling. Adam had a feeling of loneliness. And the Lord could see that he wasn't yet complete. And so he has a grand plan. His plan was much, much higher than just a biological satisfaction of a feeling. God's plans so much higher than our plans. So God comes with a solution. He always does. Every problem God fulfills and satisfies the longing need that we should have. Men and women have the same challenge. We need companionship. The need is reciprocal. It's not good that man or woman should be alone. It's vice versa. Do you know the Hebrew word for woman means Aisha? That's the Hebrew term. And it means the opposite of a man. Isn't that interesting? It's not what we hear nowadays. With gender fluidity, people say that men and women are just the same. And you can transform and change and migrate for a time if it suits you and then back again. If not, the woman is the opposite. The interlinking opposite part of man. That's what the Hebrew means. The opposite. The complementary part where man is incomplete and the woman is incomplete when they come together. There is a completion. There is a complementary fit between the man and the woman. Let me make a few broad generalizations. She will be a helper. That's what it says here. She will be a help meet, a helper. She is so helpful in the way that God has made. Men should be helpful too. But she will be particularly helpful. She will be a supporter. That's again what the word means. She will be a succorer, one that cares, one that has a peculiarly caring attitude and nature, even so more than men, generally speaking. He might build or buy a house, but she'll make a home. Men are not good at making homes. They either want everything to be perfect or they want it to be suitable, functional, but not a place where we can call home. Home is where there's hearts. It's where there's love. It's where there's care. It's where there's companionship. It's where there's noise and laughter and mess. That's where a home is. 
And the woman particularly is better at that than men are, in the main. Sure, sometimes, by necessity or gift, some of these roles can be reversed. She will be suited and suitable for Adam. But you know, two will be much, much better than one. In marriage, isn't that our experience? A good marriage, a good relationship, two minds are better than one. A man and a woman together are better than alone. Two will be able to help each other. When there's a problem, it will be better solved. With two heads and two hearts, sometimes the man only thinks of problem, 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 solution. And the woman sees that maybe it's too quick. Maybe we have to wait. Maybe the answer will be found tomorrow. Two are better to worship together than one. Worship is much better where two or three are gathered together and where we can relate and help. Two will have a selfless purpose. You have one, particularly the man. And what you see is, what do I want? What do I need? But when two come together, what's best for the other will be better for the two together. He should be the protector. He should be the provider. She will be beside him. That's literally what the Hebrew means. She will be productive. She will be precious and valued. Oh, this is the picture. This is what God is saying in this first ever human relationship which God is ordaining. Now Matthew Henry, one of the Puritans, he has something so profound, so theologically accurate, but so helpful. I cannot but read it. You have to read it and reread it. From a rib of Adam's side, Eve was made. Not out of his head to rule over him or from his feet to trample on by him. That's what happens sometimes. Women oppressed, coercion, control. Sometimes men don't realize they're doing it. They're making life so difficult, so painful taking all the joy away, all the pleasure, all the lightness, because they're trampled underfoot. That's not God's way. But from a side, not from a foot, but from a side, to be equal with him. From under his arm, to be protected by him. And from near his side, and from his heart, to be loved by him. What a beautiful picture. Do you know the significance? It was a rib, not the head, not the foot. It was there, from the heart, by the side, under the arm, protection, love, care, oneness are all symbolically pictured. Anybody that says this is just a picture, it's just a story, you lose all the meaning, all the significance of what this relationship should be in God's sight. Well, we've thought of the problem foreseen, we've thought of a helper, Eve provided, and we could spend so much time on this, but I really want to think thirdly of the relationship that's being formed. Now, this is a covenant relationship. That's important. It's not casual. It's not something you fall in and out of. 
It's not something that is a feeling and comes and goes. This is a binding covenant, a promise made forever with God's strength and God's help. This is what Adam says. Verse 23. This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, opposite of man, because she was taken out of man. Therefore, in this lifelong relationship, shall a man cleave, that's the first point, sorry, leave his father and his mother, that's the first point, leave, and secondly, shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. That's the third point. Let's look at this relationship. This is a proper marriage. There is to be a leaving, the husband and the wife leave behind the old family unit. No longer are they seeking advice, direction, rule, financial support, where possible, from the two former families. They are to willingly leave. And that's where the problem starts very often. The man, the woman, they don't leave. There's interference. This can happen particularly within certain cultures. Too much from the parents-in-law of intervention, and it should not be. There's a willing leaving, the first point. Secondly, there is a total cleaving, the woman, the man, in everything, bank account, emotionally, mentally, in terms of their hearts, their decision-taking, they are to cleave, glue themselves to each other. Do you know there's a saying today, what's marriage? Two people living together, struggling to be, in, to be independent. Is that right? Not what it says here. Two people committed together, willingly seeking to become dependent. That's the biblical picture. A willing leaving, a total cleaving, and then the third point, they shall be one flesh. You see, before it gets to the physical, there is a willingness to leave, a total binding together in every way, and then there is a striving every day. My first thought is not to me, it's to my husband, to my wife. I think of the best of the other, I subdue my preferences, my wants, what I want to do now, what I want to do with the money, what I want to do with time, and I say, what's best for the other? The total opposite. Two people striving to have their own choices, their own time, me time, down time. God says, no, they shall be one flesh. One of the members of our congregation was telling me about her husband who's no longer with her. And she was reminding me of how years ago he would come home and there would be a provision for her. Yes, he would buy a book for himself, a good theological book, but there would also be a gift for her, for the family. What a picture. No longer thinking of myself. Thinking of our selves, one, one heart, one mind, one purse, one family. That's what God wants. 
Now, let's change tack. We read in Ephesians 5 that this beautiful picture of marriage, a man and a woman defined by God, is just a precursor, an imperfect picture to the relationship that everybody one here, every one here, should have and can have with Christ. How does it work? Christ. Let's go back to the three points. There is a willing leaving. What did Christ do? He willingly left his home of heaven and came to this earth. And for that time, he was part of a different unit, you could say. He willingly left. Secondly, there was a total cleaving. His purpose now was for the church as he lived, as he taught, as he died upon the cross, as he rose again, there is a cleaving. He's looking at the church. He has in his mind's eye every single child of God that he's going to die for. He knows their names. He knows their sin. He knows their life, their character. And he has totally committed to live and to die to rise again for each one of his children. He's left heaven willingly. He's totally cleaved. He's committed to the mission to live and to die for his people. What about the third point? A oneness. He rises from the dead and we have new life in him. There's no longer a separation between us and God because he's shed his blood. And in him, we can be one. And now we live in him. Sometimes because of our sin, there's a distance. We have to come back to worship, come back to prayer, get on our knees, come back to the presence of God and say, I want what I once knew, intimacy, oneness with my God. We have to strive, but he's always so willing to give us that intimacy, that oneness. Where is the peace that once I knew? Do you ever think that? In a marriage relationship, Sometimes things grow cold. We become distant. We once were one. Now we're two and a half. Something's come between us. We go back to the Lord. And we say, help me to be right with my wife, right with my husband. I want to cleave again so that I can be one flesh, one heart, one mind. You see, that's the Christian life, isn't it? Pictured here in Genesis 2, a willing leaving, a total cleaving, and a striving for oneness. Don't you want to be one with your Savior this morning? Do you feel that closeness? When we come in prayer and there's nothing between us, I know my sins are forgiven. I'm right with God. Before him I am one. That's the picture in the marriage relationship. Is there a marriage here this morning? And you're not as close as you once were. There's been sin in the camp. The husband, you go and sort it out. That's your job, just as Christ comes to us. He draws near to us. He comes in love and mercy and tenderness 
desiring once more that we should be one with our God. Well, I want to finish this morning speaking again of that marriage relationship. It should be pure. It must be permanent. Unless there's terrible, terrible sin. And it's to be a precious, close, intimate relationship. Let me give you seven features of marriage and seven problems where they go wrong. It's the same things. Firstly, marriage is something that we choose. Nobody forces us, they shouldn't, into a marriage. What happens when things go wrong? We forget that we made a choice. Once we've made that choice, we're to keep it. We don't look to anyone else. No third party interference. No marriage is a choice. And as Thomas Watson said, once I've made my choice, I'm to love my choice. Secondly, marriage isn't an accident. We don't fall in love. As a politician said recently, when his marriage broke down, I just saw someone. No, we've made a choice. It's deliberate, it's intentional, it's a contract, it's a covenant. Where things go wrong or where people forget that they're in a contract forever. Thirdly, the purpose of marriage is not just to have children. The real purpose is for spiritual growth that comes through closer and closer walking with the Lord. A threefold cord is not easily broken. When Christ is in a marriage, you will be strong. Fourthly, it's binding. And it's permanent to my thinking. There's only three reasons. Four, if you include death, that a marriage can be broken. Death, serious, unrepented adultery. Then there is physical violence and abuse where one, probably the wife, will be in physical danger. And the person will not change their ways. And the only other way is some form of coercive control. In those cases, those three, the bond has been broken, not willingly. It's been broken and it cannot be mended irreparably. That marriage bond is broken. But in any other circumstance, we try to mend, we try to heal, we try to bring people back together. And when there's been a fall, we seek to pick one another up. Why? Because what did Christ do? He sacrificed himself fully. We should do the same. We should reunite. Sixthly, that marriage relationship is one man, one woman. That's how God defines it. God who was the creator of marriage. It cannot be in any other way. And then remember, it's a discreet unit. No one else should know what goes on within the bounds and the sanctity of that marriage unless something terrible has happened where help genuinely is needed. All oh, these are the features of marriage, biblically taught, and that's where the problems occur when marriage goes wrong. But look, let's think this morning of this covenant relationship Surely this is picturing. It's not good that a man or woman should live life alone. No, they should be one with Christ. What will God do? He will make a helpmeet. Speaking of the Saviour, 
speaking of the picture of that relationship that we will have, Christ with his bride. And we thought of the willing leaving of Christ from heaven, the total commitment to his cause, even unto Calvary, and the oneness of mind and heart and flesh that every true believer has with their Lord and with their Saviour. May the Lord help us in these things and give us rich understanding. We're going to sing our final hymn.